Welcome to Catch Outdoors. I'm your host, Captain Rob Bodies. This podcast is about living and playing down here in the Florida Keys, a 125-mile-long chain of island that run all the way from Key Largo down to Key West. I cover my favorite sport, fishing, but also all the many things to see and do down here in the islands. Catch Outdoors, host by Spotify, also brought to you by your favorite podcast network. So kick back and relax with me in the Keys. This week's episode of Catch You Outdoors is number 153. Hello all. Good morning, afternoon, evening, depending again when you're listening or tuned into the podcast. I'm recording this late on Monday, August the 26th. So for you all, that was yesterday. I uh, hope everyone had a good week. Some big news for the podcast. I'm rapidly closing in on episode number 157. The significance of this That'll be the first day of season four. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, the date for that, if all goes according to plan, will be Tuesday, September the 23rd. So mark your calendar. I got a bunch of special stuff planned. Uh, there will be, should be, a new intro and out music. Actually, one of my newly recorded songs. We're stripping out the vocals. So it'll just be some music interlude like, like you've been listening to, only I did it. It'll be fun. I think we're going to use a reggae tune, so, and I hope you like it. Uh, also, adding some time to talk specifically about boating in general. Uh, I don't know why I didn't do this from the very beginning, to tell you the truth. Probably because I didn't own a powerboat at the time. So, I'm going to cover the simple stuff first. You know, upkeep, launching, uh, trailering, navigation, safety, stuff like that. I mean, there's a lot to talk about in a boat. I've seen a lot of people do a lot of crazy things down here in the Keys, and I thought, you know, I don't know why in the world I didn't go there just to give some tips, you know? Um, also, boat purchases and, you know, what what are people buying and what are they doing with them, things like that. So it, it, it'll give me a lot of fodder. <laughs> I'm actually going to add this next week, so you don't have to wait till the uh, uh, fourth season. And next week, we'll bring another local music section update. So I noticed I got a bunch of great feedback. So that'll uh, continue about every three weeks or so. And maybe more when we get into winter season down this way. Because it gets pretty crazy at the uh, local bars and hangouts. And a lot more people are playing. And we have an influx of bands and musicians from up north who close up their business. Uh, actually, coming up here on Labor Day, they things start to dwindle up there quite a bit. And these guys come down here and start playing down here. So, so it'll be fun. Also, if you noticed, I recorded this episode on a Monday, late in the afternoon, really close to evening. As mentioned before, the construction next door has ended, and I feel like I need to have less time between the actual recording and the playback that you hear. Up until now, it's not even close to real time, so by doing Monday late, you'll be hearing up-to-date goodies, and it makes it much easier for weather predictions and things related to fishing and boating and all things outdoors. So it was tough. You know, if I record something on a Saturday or a Sunday, it skips a whole day. It skips Monday entirely. By that time, things have changed and it's hard to guess what the weather's going to do or even what to talk about down here. Things will, things will bump around quite a bit. Here's some more podcast news. YouTube informed me that my podcast qualifies for the addition to their YouTube studio. Yay, <laughs> they're already uploaded. <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise me. <laughs> um, all of my previous podcasts, and you can now listen to them through that venue, which means you can go to the television, just turn the television on and go to YouTube if you want to. Um, it's called YouTube Studio. Um, you can search for it, go to it. It's, it's, I believe it's a dot .com. Uh, once there, search for Catch You Outdoors. There's a search window, just do that, and they'll all pop right up. Also, I've got some good news from Apple Podcast. Um, it is now available on all website search engines. Um, up until that happened, um, Apple was pretty much, uh, you had a little Apple icon on your phone, mostly Apple phones, <laughs> and uh, you clicked on that to go and listen to the podcast. It was a, pod, it was a podcast button is what it was. And uh, now they have offered it to everybody via search engines. So in other words, if you use Safari, Google, DuckDuckGo, Firefox, et cetera, any of those, all you have to do is go to apple.podcast.com and then search for Catch Outdoors in the upper left search box. 
I love this. <laughs> and by the way, they've already uploaded all the um, episodes as well. So you'll get the latest and greatest stuff as well as the new stuff that way if you're an Apple person. Here's some news hot off the press. This pertains to Florida, but no matter where you live, you need to be aware that the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the FDEP for short, are making plans to add golf courses and pickleball courts and even some resort rooms to Florida State Parks. Yes, this could happen where you live, so pay attention. I'll read this to you. August the 19th, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection announced the 2425 Great Outdoors Initiative. Sounds good, doesn't it? Which proposes the construction of lodges, golf courses, pickleball courts, disc golf courses, and several state parks across the state of Florida. This development could have, this is a comment by someone, this development could have a devastating impact on the unique ecosystems and wildlife of these parks. I could not agree more. Six of the nine parks listed have beach habitats, <clears throat> big beach habitats. They're coastal, which are used by nesting sea turtles and numerous other species. Um, these six parks are Anastasia State Park, located on Florida's northeast coast in St. Augustine. It includes over 1,600 acres of beaches, sand dunes, tidal marshes, and maritime hammocks. Camp Helen State Park in Panama City Beach in Florida Panhandle. Camp Helen State Park is bordered by the Gulf of Mexico and by Powell Lake. It features beaches, marshes, and forest trails. Here's one I'm familiar with. Janelle and I used this back in the 90s. Don, Dr. Von Mizell, Ula Johnson State Park. It's an undeveloped coastal ecosystem in Broward County in southeast Florida. It's awesome. I spent a lot of time fly fishing in a little creek in there, um, just so you know. Grayton Beach State Park, located in Santa Rosa Beach. Uh, this park includes pristine beaches, western lake, and miles of trails through coastal forests. Topsail Hill Preserve State Park, located in Florida's Panhandle. This park has uh, old-growth pine forest. Cool. Sandy scrublands, dunes, and wetlands. It's home to 13 imperiled species. Honeymoon Island State Park includes them in miles of sandy beach and slash pine forest and is located on Florida's west coast in Dunedin. I'm very familiar with that one. Um, I grew up in Clearwater nearby. Uh, Hillsborough River. Now, here's, here's the others. There are three others. Uh, Hillsborough River State Park, just a few miles away from downtown Tampa. This park offers wildlife viewing, fishing, hiking, biking, and picnicking. Jonathan Dickinson State Park in Hobie Sound in Martin County features the Loxahatchee River, coastal sand hills, upland lakes, and scrub forest. And last but not least is Alita River State Park, over a thousand acres in North Miami, um, North Miami Beach, I should say. Alita River State Park is Florida's largest urban park, offering paddling through mangrove forests and miles of bicycling trails. After the FDEP released its proposal, environmental organizations and Floridians have spoken out. Boy, have they ever against it. All of the parks were originally created to protect habitat and wildlife, which the proposed development could harm. Luckily, there are several ways Florida's Floridians can help. There are online petitions that are also scheduled, oh, and sorry, and also scheduled public meetings. Well, there were. <laughs> That's why I stopped there. On August 23rd, public meetings originally scheduled for the 27th were rescheduled. That, that would have been tomorrow. Uh, or actually, you're listening on Tuesday, so that would have been on Tuesday. We're rescheduled for the week of September the 2nd. Additional information is to come. It's important to note that the original meetings were canceled because the turnout would most likely far exceed the capacity of the original meeting places. Go figure. Also, all the meetings were scheduled on the same day and time in all locations. you got to love that kind of stuff. I mean, people in Miami and Broward County, could, they're close to each other. They could easily attend both meetings if they were different times. And people share those parks. It seems they don't want any opposition. Um, now, let me say this. Uh, this is my note now. Back to me. I have nothing against golf, frisbee golf pickleball, or any other outdoor recreational sport. I do, however, think that placing them in a state park that was designed to protect wildlife <laughs> is a very bad environmental idea. Um, I don't think this will go through, but you I mean, uh, one of them is supposed to get three golf courses. I, I can't even imagine. I, who? Never mind. <laughs> I don't know who thought this up. 
Uh, and I'll find out. And I'm sure we'll have more, so I will bring that to you as I, as I get it. One more controversial subject. This isn't political, so don't, don't, don't get in a sweat now. I, I avoid that when I can. Although it's getting tougher and tougher to avoid it. Uh, after dinner on Saturday night at the Fish House, we came home and listened to some Jimmy Buffett albums. Yep, and then we headed to bed at about 10 p.m. That's a good way to clear your head of all the crap that's on the news right now. That's all I have to say about that. But now about that controversial subject. It seems that the Florida Keys are seriously looking into putting slow zones under all the bridges. At least that's where this has started. Uh, it, it, it's directly in response to the boat accidents that happened recently during the lobster mini mini season and the regular mini season. Um, it's pretty obvious that a lot of lobster searchers hunt for them around bridge pilings and in the riprap that's placed there to limit the erosion from uh, storms and waves and stuff like that. Great place for lobster to hide. It's long been a scary proposition for anyone to dive or snorkel there. I've seen it and done it. And even with dive flags, people have been hit and there are also a lot of close calls. So it's it was interesting to me to find out there are very few slow zones associated with bridges here in the Keys. Considering I, I'm, I'm just relating it back to being a guide in Lee County, which are the bridges of Fort Myers, Sanibel, Captiva, Mount Lache, uh, Fort Myers Beach, et cetera, et cetera. For a very long time, I, I believe that Collier County also has the same thing. There are slow zones on every bridge. A hundred, I believe it's a hundred feet on either side, hundred yards maybe, hundred yards on either side. You have to slow down, and uh, you go into the bridge slow, and then you pick up. The, part of their reason has obviously has nothing to do with getting lobster. <laughs> or diving under it, snorkeling. It's about not, it's the visibility, not being able to see left or white, right when you're roaring under a bridge. See, when you're coming underneath a bridge, there is tra cross traffic. And out of the corner of your eye, if you're blocked by pilings in a bridge and a bridge surface, you're not going to see somebody coming. And if you do, it's probably too late. And so Lee County put that in place a long time ago, and they're pretty strict about it. They will, they will hand you a ticket if you race underneath the bridge. Uh, a lot of it had to do with jet skis. You know, a lot of people like to use the uh, personal watercraft, and that was also an issue. They were zipping in and out of the bridge, and every now and then one of them would catch a piling, and that's bad. Heck, we just had two fatalities down here. A guy ran in his headlong into a seawall with his son on board and killed them both. So this slow thing to me makes sense. Some people are going to get real upset about it. The people that dive under it and go and go lobster will be thrilled. <laughs> I just can't believe it didn't happen uh, sooner. But we'll see how it goes. There'll be some follow-ups. There'll be some uh, the usual, you know, batting back and forth and stuff like that. So I'll follow up with a podcast and let you know. And if it does happen, then that's something you'll want to be aware of when you come down here to vote. You're going to have to slow down when you go under a bridge. So next on the list let's see what i got here i got all kinds of stuff today i've been somewhat involved in a discussion on a web page <clears throat> about climate change i believe that climate change i believe climate changes all the time <laughs> constantly and then it's fluctuated for centuries if not millennia but the cool part about this discussion was about the rising sea level and it was also quite civil and a lot of times when people start talking about climate change they are not civil there, it, it's kind of funny. People just tend to draw a line right down the middle. You either believe it or you don't. And if you don't, you're adamant about it. And if you do, you're adamant. And I, I find that somewhat irritating because from a science perspective, which I have, um, it's entirely possible. But it's been going on for a long, long time. And um, it's been pointed out over the last couple of years that coastal Florida has been affected by this rise. It, it's visible. I mean, you can see it especially along the east coast of Miami and Fort Lauderdale. That seems to be about the worst that I'm aware of in Florida. I mean, I've heard of it in other areas, but that seems to be the worst place. Um, that was interesting to me. A direct scientific observation was made about tide levels. It seems they have really haven't changed. They haven't really changed very much. So at least in many places, for example, I fish and boat a bunch in the Keys and even more on the southwest coast of Florida. Over the last couple of years, I've noticed almost no difference in the height of tides here in the Keys. They're highs and lows. I mean, just like they've always been, There's, they don't wash out the bushes and they don't disappear. Um, you know, they, they do what they've always done. The water levels stay about the same. 
I mean, there's difference due to seasons, summer versus winter, but both levels have remained the same as far as I can tell. So the question brought up as why other places along the coast, especially the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast, they're having some trouble outside of Fort Myers, too. Um, And the Eastern Atlantic, why do they flood every time it rains? And the consensus is, from the group of people that we're talking, overbuilding, overpopulation. Cover up the ground with concrete and provide no new drainage system. I'm not kidding. Every time Miami gets a couple of inches of frog-choking rain, the streets in many neighborhoods just flood. Here's my example of an observation that happened to Janelle and me during Hurricane Irma while living in Fort Myers. We had been through a number of storms over the almost 20 years we lived there and some really big wet hurricanes. Until Irma, we had never had any water come up our street, much less in our garage. The higher water mark in the garage was nine inches. The water almost made it into the house. But do you want to know why? Okay, here's my theory based on this talk that we all had. When we moved into our house, we were maybe a quarter mile from I-75 on the west side of the highway. So if you're going north, we were on the left-hand side. There was nothing on the right, just woods and farms and a huge gravel pit off of Alico Road. Uh, there was there was just nothing out there. Uh, the other side of I-75 was a, a blank canvas, pretty much. No, it was a blank canvas. And the building began. The first huge shopping center called the Gulf Coast Town Center went in. That was where Bass Pro is and a lot of other shops. At first, a huge shopping center called that, and then And then once that got going, FGCU, which was a little bitty college at the time, it started to expand. So it started to build uh, apartment dormitories, expand its campus and stuff like that. Um, Then after that, an enormous, um, I mean huge, a mini city went in. (laughs) Uh, It's part of Miramar is what it was called. They had all kinds of recreational stuff and hundreds and thousands of houses Uh, on the other side of Bass Pro. And then before we left, they built even more. They expanded it to, I forget what it was. It was another 1,200 houses, I believe. So basically, they were covering all the land up to the east of us. If you know anything about Florida, all rain that falls inland moves toward the Gulf or the ocean. It's inevitable. Some of it gets south. They're They're trying to fix that, as you all are probably well aware of. Not enough of it's going into Florida Bay. A great deal of it comes east and west. So over time, we began to see water after rain start to appear in a small swale in our front yard. We had a ditch, like most people do. It wasn't a big ditch, just enough to keep the rain off the road. And it would go away right away. We'd get a little rain in the swell, and by a day later, it was gone. And then it stopped draining fast, and the swell started filling up, and they were staying full during the summer season, the rainy season, long enough that we had a population of tadpoles in the ditch. That gives you an idea how long it was wet. And then along comes Irma. While I'm not about to discount scientific observation about climate change and sea level rise, I do seriously think that we, the powers that be, are building much too quickly without thought for proper drainage. And if, in fact, the sea is slowly rising combined with the overbuilding, coastal communities are in for a world of hurt. That's my opinion. It's it's not going to stop. They're already building more stuff. <laughs> They're already asking for more building. They're doing it. They're doing it everywhere. And if you don't have drainage and the rains come and the hurricanes come, everything's going to flood. And I honestly believe that has a lot to do with what's wrong in Miami-Dade and Broward County over in Fort Lauderdale. I honestly think that they have I, do a city shot. You know, get online and go to Google and get your aerial or, or city shots or or uh, beat shots of the downtown Miami area and all the condos. It'll blow your mind. It's kind of like New York City. It's really amazing how tightly things are packed. So when the water comes, it ain't got nowhere to go. Now, when the tide is high, you got a full moon tide, which we have, and you've got water up coming in on the tide, and the rain comes down like crazy, and it washes off all that pavement, it's got nowhere to go. It can't drain. It's impossible. The tidal water is holding it in. And I honestly think that's what the problem is. So, don't know how to fix it. I just wanted to give my two cents worth because I keep hearing about this. Oh, we're flooding like crazy. we got to raise everything in the air. Well, yeah, you probably will if you keep building stuff. 
Um, <laughs> so and that's the way it is. Um, by the way, I want to go back and say I have I want to reiterate this. I have seen very little change in high and low tide marks where I fish in Florida Bay and the back country of, of the Florida Keys. I've seen very little along the beach. I've seen very little along the Gulf side when you go out to Cape Sable. High tide is high and low is low. It seems to be pretty much exactly the way it always looks. The only time I see it higher in the back is when we get a ton of rain coming into the Everglades and the Everglades uh, sheet flow picks up and you wind up having more water come in than usual with the high tide. You will see higher water up on the mangroves, but it's not actually just makes it fishable if you really want to know. And on that note, I didn't fish this week. Yeah, well, let's just say too blasted hot. And then once the heat let up, it started raining. <laughs> rained it. It's rained every day the last three days. It's, and it's unpredictable stuff, too. A little bit of lightning and thunder and then a, a smashing rainstorm. And it goes away and the daggone sun comes out. Right now we have a breeze at about 10. Tomorrow it's supposed to be 10 to 15 out of the east-southeast. Or just east, I believe, tomorrow at about 10 to 15. That's not really doable. Plus, I'm going to wait out a little bit of uh, water, rain. And then I'm going to try for Wednesday or Thursday or both. So there you go. I got enough to do tomorrow. I'm doing all kinds of, I'm getting things done, all kinds of fun chores, mostly music related, but you know. Uh, I do want to talk briefly about tides for fishing. Um, since I've brought all this tide stuff up and, and I've put it in both of my fishing books, what I know about fishing Southwest Florida and what I know about fishing the Florida Keys, there are chapters devoted to tides and the importance of understanding them as a matter of fact. That subject appears in the first chapter of both of those books. It's called Science. That's the name of the chapter. If you're new to fishing Florida coastal waters, or perhaps you've fished a lot of those waters and you're not having much luck, it's probably tide-related. Simply put, if the water isn't moving in either direction, the fish most likely won't bite. Yep, most saltwater fish are lazy ambush feeders. They lay in wait for something to swim by, and then they attack it. This also true for fish on the move. You could, you should notice this when fish are moving about. Most game fish are facing the tide. It's like a river of food coming right at them, and that makes it easy for them to snap down breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It's important to know this because if you cast um, behind a fish, you're probably not going to get a bite, and you may also just plain spot. Uh, spook the fish so yeah fun <laughs> how many have done that <laughs> study the water movement when you're out there get a feel for where your prey is coming from and then make your cast and presentation it's also good to know that over all tides they are higher in the summer and lower in the winter the location of the sun has a lot to do with that. It has all of it to do with that. The, the tilt of the earth, if you will. Uh, as the sun is in the southern skies, it, 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 or in the northern, yeah, southern skies, it takes the water with it. That happens in the winter. And in the summer, when the sun comes up high, it pulls water back up with it. The sun doesn't really move. The earth moves back and forth. So, um, so basically, winter versus summer, lows and highs. Uh, in, in the winter, uh, lows, and, lows are lower and highs are lower. In the summer, lows are higher and high tide is higher. There now you're probably terribly confused. You'll have to wind this back and repeat it several times. <laughs> um, there's many, many ways to check tides too. I have I've been through all kinds of tide apps trying to figure all this out. And quite honestly, um, the paper charts and newspapers were the way everybody went for the longest time. That's pretty much passe now. And most people don't do that. I mean, they're in there. I've seen them. Just so you know, magazines carry it too. But there's lots of apps for your phone. Um, I have two favorites. Uh, I use one called Tide Guide, just like it sounds, T-I-D-E, Guide. And um, the other one is Windy. I don't know if you all found this. I recently got Windy about maybe four months ago. I, I read something about it, and people were raving. I'm like, okay, i got to go look at this. And it's awesome. I'm not kidding you. So uh, Windy, though, is is everything in one wrap and extremely detailed and extremely technical. It's a little fun to play with. You may you may feel a little put out by some of the stuff, but at, once you get used to navigating it, you can basically get everything in one spot. It has um, 
moon over moon under, are the fish going to bite or not, barometric pressure, tidal movement where you are, how fast the tide is going, wind directions, as well as gust. And things are noted on like maps so you can see it. It's incredible. It's a really the neatest little program I've played with. And uh, that was that's probably going to be a mainstay. I'm not so sure I'm going to have to use Tide Guide much much anymore with with the invention of that application. Um, it also has radar too, by the way. Wendy has weather radar built into it. So, and now here's something about my books. Yay! I just started running a special on my previous books. This time, uh, selling them as a mass group, <laughs> three in one. You can get via my website at catchoutdoors.com all three of my previous books for one group price for all three. Uh, still got some, and it's time to move them. I really, they have to go. Come on, y'all. Uh, the three are What I Know About Fishing Southwest Florida, Bridge to Paradise, and the award-winning, it's fun to say that, <laughs> Take a Kid Fishing, an adult's guide for introducing youngsters to the world of angling. Um... Take a Kid is pretty much my take on teaching kids to fish. I spent a lot of time on charters with them and decided to write a book about what I'd experienced and pass that along to other adults, would-be parents, uh, aunts, uncles, grandparents, stuff like that. Bridge to Paradise is a collection of stories about fishing, my, uh, my travels, and life. Many of the stories come from articles written for other outdoor magazines with a few added just for the book. Um, it's something to read on a rainy day. That's what I call it, a rainy day book. What I know about fishing in Southwest Florida. What I know about it, I know a lot. <laughs> 20 years of almost every day. Um, that statement's true. I spent hours and days and months and years on the waters of Southwest Florida as a guide. I also taught fishing classes at night school in Naples and at Bass Pro Shops in Fort Myers. Students were always bugging me. They were telling me, you, you really need to write a book about this stuff and put it down, you know, about your, do your fishing classes in a book. And I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, sure, sure, sure. And then we moved from the Fort Myers area to Fort Lauderdale, and then, and then COVID hit. Wasn't that fun? I was bored to death, pulled out the notes from my years of teaching, and finally wrote that book. I'm always surprised when I get the Amazon report of where that daggone thing is selling. It kind of blows me away. Um, recently as far away as Australia and quite a few selling or uh, do sell and have sold in Europe. That's amazing and gratifying at the same time. Uh, all three titles are selling in a group of three for 45 bucks, including shipping and all are original releases and all will be signed. The sale runs until the end of September. So you go to catchyoutdoors.com. Go to page four. You'll see all the books in order. And at the bottom, I added this. I added this. And all you got to do is click on it. And I'll get it. And I will ship all three books to you for the low, low price of technically 40 bucks. Five dollars to ship book book uh, book rate. So 45 bucks. The recent Saturday Red Tide report once again showed no hits from coastal Florida. Man, I'm telling you what. Somebody's doing good. <laughs> Thank goodness, right? Apple TV series called Bad Monkey starring Vince Vaughn was on again this past Wednesday, episode three. Still good and hanging in there. It's always fun to see scenes from the Keys and Key West in a movie or a show, and it's also very well done. I, you know, I was really worried because uh, Carl Hyacin is a favorite of mine and a favorite of Janelle's. We love his books. They're very humorous, uh, well done mysteries written around the nonsense of Florida. And they did a really good job so far of presenting it. So uh, it happens every Wednesday. So if you haven't tuned in yet, you can watch three episodes right now. And then tomorrow night uh, will be Wednesday. Uh, you'll have episode number four. Um, I received several nice notes about last week's podcast. And along with one of them, my friend Mike mentioned that he was taking all that rain they were having up in Tampa Bay area by getting a couple of books by another author I recommended, James W. Hall. I love his books and his continuing central character, Thorne, a mysterious figure from the Keys. <laughs> he is. <laughs> He's not a nice guy. That's just my opinion. He always seems to wind up in the middle of solving the unsolvable mystery. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Um, <laughs> I should write a back cover for novels. 
Uh, I told Mike I have a story about James Hall that I'm going to relate here for listeners, and especially for the fans of Thorne and James W. Hall. I thought I'll do it now. It's short. And I just, it's just something that happened to me a, a long time ago. Many years ago, this was back in 1997, I was working as a telecom manager for a big Florida bank. I was stationed, as I like to put it, in West Palm Beach. I was also hooked on reading mystery novels, especially those written by Florida authors. And so was Jonelle. When James Hall's newest release, Red Sky at Night, came out, uh, he was making his usual rounds uh, for book signings around the state. And, and one of those small bookstores was an internet cafe in West Palm Beach slash bookstore. And uh, you remember those? Remember internet cafes? <laughs> right in downtown. Great sandwiches, you know, things like that. But you could, you could get Wi-Fi connection, you know, and be able to do your work in there. Get on the internet. I made a note of the date and time and went to, on a lunch break to make sure I was there. And unfortunately, Jonelle couldn't join me. So she said, please get me a book and please get it signed. And I'm like, yeah, no problem. I'd be happy to do that. He was there, but no one else was. It seemed that the wrong date had been posted by the bookstore and corrected, but I didn't see it. But James Hall showed up just in case that might happen. There was only one other person. The gal got her book, had it signed and left. I picked up a copy and told Hall that I'm a real fan. <laughs> and I really wasn't a big, big fan back in 97, but Janelle was. And I said, my wife is, and she really wanted me to get this book for her. I mean, while I enjoyed his books, she was really bummed that she couldn't be there. I can tell you that right now. So, so he signed the book to Janelle and asked me if I'd join him for lunch at the cafe. I said, sure. And I'm thinking to myself, Janelle's going to kill me. This, this would be, she would love this. As it turned out, we both loved fly fishing. We both loved catching tarpon. We had both lived in Kentucky, and he had a fondness for the North Carolina mountains, as so did I. My parents had, had a chalet up there for a while, and I spent some, actually, I spent a lot of summers up in the mountains of North Carolina, and so did he. We turned out having a really great conversation, and I became a big fan that day. I got home, told Janelle what had happened. She was doubly bummed, but she got the book. And it's signed, and I have it. I look the other day. I pulled it out to make sure I was talking about the right, the right one, and I was. So <laughs> there you go. There's your short story about James W. Hall. Listen, if you haven't read it, get him. Um, his the books are in order, and off the top of my head right now, I can't remember the the number one book, but uh, you could pull it up and just say James W. Hall Thorn Books in order, and it'll give you the first one. By all means, uh, if you're a Florida freak and you like Florida mysteries and you like stuff about the Keys that take place in the Keys, um, I'd highly recommend it. August the thirtieth is officially Jimmy Buffett Day. Yeah, nationwide, and Key West is making sure to be a big part. In the celebration, obviously. <laughs> After all, Key West is considered by many to be the original Margaritaville, including me. It's going to be a weekend-long festival with lots of cover bands for live music, and they're even going to do another parade for Jimmy down Duval Street. So if you missed it the first time, now is your chance. I don't think we're going to make it down there, but I sure as heck are going to watch and see what happens online. I'm, Instagram will have it. I'm sure Facebook will cover it and YouTube will have it. So you can kind of get a taste of what's going on. I expect that the city will be packed uh, with Jimmy Buffett fans. So it should, should be a lot of fun. And now it's time for uh, useless information. And now from the original book of useless information. You are a reject! You are useless! You can get a job down here cleaning toilets! Here's your host, Captain Rob Modis. Well, he swears up and down he's useless. But, uh, he might be all right eventually, but completely useless. With useless information. Thank you, Rick. That was awesome. <laughs> here we go. You're more likely to be killed by a champagne cork than a poisonous spider. I have a friend who will be happy to know that. 13 people a year are killed by vending machines falling on them. I bet I know what that's from. Odds of being killed by a tornado are 1 in 2 million. Odds of being killed by falling out of bed are also 1 in 2 million. <laughs> so don't fall out of bed, all right? <laughs> Lord. And there you go until next week. 
And before I go, some final words. Next week, I'm jumping back into the music scene here in the Keys. Um, September is a very quiet month for many of the establishments down here, but many are still rocking and rolling. I'm also going to do my absolute best to get back on the water. (laughs) I promise. (laughs) I hope everyone has a great Labor Day weekend. And you get to spend some extra time outside with family and friends. For some of you all up north, it's the last weekend for the swimming pools to be open. Oh, that used to bum me out when I lived up in Kentucky. So anyhow, you better get to the grocery store, pick up those hot dogs, hamburger, meat, and chicken, along with some cold beer and all the fixings for the grill and for the burgers and the dogs. And I hope you're blessed with good weather. I'll talk to you all next week. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed listening, please tell a friend, leave a review, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. The Facebook page is Catchy Outdoors. The website is CatchyOutdoors.com, where you can find all the previous podcasts and a schedule of what's coming up. Until next time, get outdoors and enjoy. Enjoy.